give me one. Uh, I'm in the hair salon now, y'all. So. Oh, <laughs> that's so good. I- <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode, a very Detroit episode. <laughs> yes. yes. Of Quest Love Supreme. <laughs> if you're uh if you're watching our soft launch, our ever our never ending soft launch on uh YouTube, then you know you know why this is uh a very Detroit episode. Um if you're just listening, I ain't describing nothing to y'all right now. Uh we got Team Supreme in the house. Uh Fontigolo. What, what up, up, bro? What up, man? Wow, How's it been going? On this for a while, I've been waiting on this one for a minute, man. Going well, going well. Yes, uh, we yeah. we've little we've been brother, waiting we were, for this one for a minute. Yeah, man, little brother, we were honored recently in our city in uh, Durham uh, with a proclamation from the mayor, and um, you know, so it was we're celebrating our twentieth year as well as hip hop's you know fifty year, of course, and uh, you know there will be no little brother without the group that we have on today. So exactly, it's, exactly, it's been a dream come true. That I've been waiting on this one for a minute. Sugar Steve, what up, bro? What up, everybody? How you doing? What up, though? Actually, I should say, what up, though, uh, Sugar Steve? How, how's it going? Everything's good. I'm uh, a couple of our a couple of our albums have have caught fire on uh, on our record label, and so I'm, but now I got to spend my whole day shipping fucking records all over the world. So um, it's a all mixed, right. mixed blessing. That's that's a good problem to have, man. You you had a dream of. Uh, your own label and uh it's happening and you know that's amazing um speaking speaking of of albums that that uh have set the world and movements on fire um i will say that the the totality the the entire legacy uh of our guest today um just ring strong in not only hip hop culture but in music and everything from their production to their delivery to their cadence. Um, to be honest with you, just uh, the love, the love that they have for their city of Detroit, the love that they have for each other, for hip hop culture, um, for innovation, for like doing something original. Um, I guess you could say that their chemistry is to me like the 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 most important element that has kept the legacy uh of this group alive. It's not, you know, about one specific member over another member. It's 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 about just the overall chemistry and the contributions that um that various members have given this particular organization and you know me myself nothing nothing will ever 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 i mean to be i don't know it's like once you get in this industry you kind of see things different from a production standpoint from a creative standpoint like there's a part of your life where music means something to you before you get in the industry and then there's a part of your life when once you're in the industry, you see things different. Like you see everyone as a peer. And I don't know when anything that this group has created. I don't know. I just I, I hold it. Uh, I hold it like the, the Holy Scriptures coming from <laughs> Moses. I don't know. I, I can go on with a gazillion uh, descriptions about how important the legacy of this group is, especially on hip hop's 50th anniversary. But, you know. We're gonna to get to to just rap. It was something we haven't done in a long time. Um, friends of the show, y'all, welcome to Slum Village yes, to sir. Quest Love Supreme. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. I'm sorry, that, that was like a lifetime achievement. Yes, thank <laughs> you. NAACP <laughs> Image Awards feature shit. I know, right? I, I should have been to BT Awards this week. I don't know. No, yeah. uh, you know RJ Rice and 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 T3. Thank you, man. Thank you for coming. What's the word, man? Appreciate you having us. Thank you. Sure. RJ, where are you right now? In the studio. We finishing up this album. Okay. So you're you're still in Detroit right now? Still in Detroit. Yeah. All right. And T3, you you the same? Yeah, I'm I'm in Detroit at the crib, chilling. Um, just happy to be here, man. And and you know, happy to be a part of this 
wonderful show. Thank you. Wait, I got to ask y'all. Um, you know, I I absolutely positively uh never miss an opportunity to talk out how important the city of Detroit was to my creativity. I mean, you know, in addition to just interacting with you guys and you know, even for Batin, for 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 Dilla, uh, anyone. I mean, even Illa J, like whoever has come from the city of Detroit. But, you know, a lot of my creativity, like a lot of the music I worked on, I technically did in that city. That's important to me. And, you know, so I feel like I have a relationship with the city as well that was instrumental, like between 97 and around like 2006. Uh, and even like when I tour, like I, I know places by heart, I go by myself. Um, Detroit's a little bit different now. Like from what I'd known it as 25 years ago, like just as residents of the city, how do you guys feel about what's happening in Detroit? Like, is it, is it, is it progress? Like things are just different now. Like former firehouses are now like five-star hotels and, for sure, you know, we rebuild it, you know, okay. and, and it's a good look for the city. You know, it was desolate and bleak for so long, you know, that now we finally getting, you know, what I'm saying the downtown back how it's supposed to be. We finally getting the neighborhoods that was rent uh, run down, you know, they tearing them down and rebuilding. So, you know, it's, it's good for the city, you know what I'm saying? And I'm happy to see it, you know what I'm saying? It make me want to stay in Detroit, you know what I'm saying? Not ready to get up out of here and go somewhere right. else. Right. So the temptation has never been strong to be like, all right, well, let's relocate to Atlanta or like go down south or anything. Nah, nah, nah. not for me. No, 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 not for us because you know what? It's just the vibe. You know, we like, and you could be to yourself. You could be, you could be bothered or or not bothered. It's a choice you make, and I, right. I think, I think that's something we like. You, you know, you know us. We kind of stick to ourselves. So, uh, yeah, Detroit is a plus for that. You know, oftentimes, like, all right, take a, take a city, a musical city like Austin. Um, Austin takes a pride in its weirdness. Um, for me, though, like the black version of what I see Austin in terms of, I've just never seen a city so open. And once I realized that, you know, you guys were raised on uh, the electrifying mojo, and if, you know, you guys uh, listening, go on YouTube and just start listening to Electrifying Mojo. You got to realize that this dude was basically one of the last of the Mohicans in terms of um, there was a time when like Celestial Radio really trusted its DJs to do whatever they wanted to do. You know, now like you kind of are your prisoner of corporate radio, which, you know, the, the the playlists are like predetermined before you even September's playlist has already been determined for you. So whereas a guy like Electrify Mojo back in the early 80s was like just playing some of the weirdest music ever. And so, you know, once his listeners are growing up and immersed in this music, it's it's like no wonder Detroit is such a creative hub where people just think different. Is is that weirdness still prevalent in Detroit right now as we speak? Or, you know, or do you see, you know, in Philadelphia, like there is the, their own weirdo movement happen that has nothing to do with what the roots were about. But, you know, I still support it, even though it's not from our ilk. Like, is that happening in D Detroit right now? Um, I think it's still happening. I think a lot of uh, a lot of the people that are the younger people that are kind of weird, they came up after, they came up on us. I get a lot of that from the people like Curtis Roach and, and a couple of other cats from Detroit. But then, right. you know, Detroit has a whole nother side, which is this hood. So you, <laughs> so you, go from, you, know, you go from these creative people to just hood. You know what I'm saying? And right. then, then you got the creative hood, which is kind of a merge of both, which is like Sada Baby. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Stuff like that. So see, that's the thing. I I even though I think 
you guys in the very beginning might have been slightly defensive towards how we saw y'all because, you know, like the music was one way, but you guys were saying some like crazy outlandish shit on top of it. Like right. y'all just as hood and creative. But I don't know with the first time I came from Detroit, I'm like, yo, this, this is like a city that will listen to Thomas Dolby and do the Carlton but they're also going to beat your ass if you fuck with them. Like, and that's the shit I couldn't get. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, you know I mean, because, you know, we, sure. we, we've always been a collective. Uh, we always been, uh, I mean, we grew up on Tribe and NWA at the same mm -hmm. time. It wasn't either or. It wasn't rock, jazz. It was any music that we can find creatively. We there. And then we grew up on techno, which is totally something else, you know, in itself. I think that's right? key. I think yeah. you guys embracing electronic music and techno right. is the key to why Detroit's so crazy. Yes, yes, creatively, yes. See, see, you had it at one point where they would play all the hood stuff during the day, you know what I'm saying, the commercial stuff. Then at nighttime, when people go into the clubs, it was like all techno, you know what I'm saying, stuff like that. So our prime time getting ready for the party was techno music. So, yeah. you know, we, we had see. the opportunity to have that balance, you know what I'm saying, like T was saying. So, um, could you take us back to the beginning to where, like, if I'm looking, I guess in archaeology terms, like, if I'm looking for the the, the spark, the, you know, the, the sticks and stones that, like, built a spark, where does the actual, where does the story of Slum Village begin? Okay, I would say it began in Persian high school where we we were, you know what I'm saying, a school, uh, you know, Persian high school, which is this, because when I was coming up to be a rapper, you know, it was weird. That was considered weird to be a rapper. You know what wow. I'm saying? Being okay. Detroit, because it's just so like, you know, even though it was a few rappers, hood rappers that was out there, but... What we was on, we was extra LONS, extra, you know, <laughs> so we were walking around, you know, uh, extra clothes, extra, you know, dreadlocks, you know, we, we, we very, we out there, you know, right. <laughs> early, you know, you know what I'm saying? So when I heard about other guys that were like me, I was like, oh, okay, now we got a squad. You know what I'm saying? So now that, you know, I ran into Dilla because I heard about him through this guy, through that guy. Heard about by 10 and then Wajid and every, and it just all clicked up. So it was. So like, it wasn't a neighborhood thing. Like they weren't. They weren't your next door neighbors. Like you heard about them from the other side of town or. I mean, we in the same neighborhood, believe it or not. But I did not know that. OK. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Which is like, I mean, in Detroit, you're not going to come outside your house and just walk around and. You know, you know what I'm saying? So you going to your house, you know what I'm saying, to your destination and back because you don't want no static. You don't want nothing to happen. So you just going to where you going. So I, even though we closed and we all in Coney Gardens, it was just like different random parts. Like, right. and I had them if it went for school, you know. So, RJ. Yo. Um, actually, you know, um, our listeners out there should know that, I mean, you come from a lineage of you know Detroit hip hop For being sure. as though you know your father is you know the legendary RJ of RJ's latest arrival like I grew up listening to Shackles like they used to Heaven always in play your arms is the one for me that's the one like that's the, which I, one Heaven in your arms yeah <laughs> exactly on my rotation right now still on my spot yeah time. so <laughs> you know can you can you talk about just growing up uh, as sort of like lineage of Detroit culture, like, what is your childhood like with, you know, with your parents that are popping? Like, you know, I have them on Soul Train. I have them on, you know what I mean? Like, they were national. They were always played on radio. So what was it like just growing up in that environment? I grew up on the road. So between them touring and stuff, you know, like, I was like out on a fresh fest and you know stuff like that with them as a kid with Fat Boys and Run DMC and all of that. So that's kind of how I grew up. So were there Jermaine sightings as well? Because 
I thought Jermaine was the only kid that was like allowed in the press fest. Did you get to see him at all? Like, nah, because remember, I'm 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 ten years younger than T. Oh, so, okay. So okay. I was like two. Okay, two, three years old. So Jermaine Dupree was like eleven, twelve. Okay, yeah. I get it. Yeah. So between that and then you know when they would be on the road when I got to a certain age, I I would be with my grandmother. And my grandmother stayed in Coney Gardens because that's where my father grew up at. Gotcha. So that's how all of everybody right. kind of came together. Can y'all describe Coney Gardens like we I know it as a song, but <laughs> what is the neighborhood of Coney Gardens? <laughs> uh it's a it's a it's a hood, but it's not like you know what I'm saying? It still got good people. It still had a good batch of people there. It wasn't overly violent, but it did have its hood aspects. You know what I'm saying? We we always had a nice park. I lived right right across the street of a nice park. We had a nice you know place to play and whatever. So I mean, you know, we, I don't know why, uh, you know, we had so much respect for. It. And it's the only neighborhood really in the hood where you see where they got the actual. The actual banner where it says Coney Gardens, like they named this hood. You know what I'm saying? I, they they don't really don't do that. It usually be like East West, that you know whatever the name of the street is. But they actually named the whole neighborhood. So once we saw that, you know, we just gravitated to it, and because you know we had found each other in in you know in this awkward little place. You know what I'm saying? This little patch of land. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know what so so as 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 late child, as late children of the seventies and eighties, um, just in your general childhood, how aware of you guys of the lineage of Detroit? Like, was, was living in Detroit just like to you, growing up in the early eighties? Like, ah, man, this this town used to have something, and then everyone left it. Like, there's no more music left. Like, was there still a, a a strong presence of the music lineage that the world knows as like Detroit? Um, I definitely say, yeah, man, I grew up on the Motown sound. That's, it was definitely part of my household, part of everybody. Everybody was still very proud of that. Even though Motown had left and went to Cali, you know what I'm saying? We were still very proud of that. We still had the Motown museum. We still had, you know, we were still proud of all the musicians that came through. So that was a definite, just soul music in general. We was we was all grew up on that. That was definitely part of our, you know, our our bringing up. You know, I would say. Yeah. I want to ask y'all, man, specifically when you were talking about techno earlier, new dance show and the scene. Break break that down. Like, what <laughs> what did that mean to to uh, to Detroit culture? Uh, that was everything. Everybody used to run in the house and mm -hmm. tune in. Our version of Soul Train, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When well, you see dancers who became popular in the neighborhood for showing up, and 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 also it broke a lot of rappers too. A lot of uh, up and coming rappers they they got a chance to perform on that. So the new dance show was everything for us. Um, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. My wife worked at the museum now for the uh, for the new dance show, so wow. it's, it's still part of my life today. You know what I'm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, man, it's, it definitely inspired us in, in many ways. Um, you know what I'm saying? I will say that the scene, um, you know, if you to our listeners out there, if you've not watched it, um, uh, just to describe it, like most most uh, territories, uh, parts of the United States would have their local dance show. Detroit had the scene. Um, I know Chicago had a, a show that was more geared to stepping. Okay. Um, Philadelphia, we had our show called Dance It On Air, um, which found some success and actually became national, known as Dance Party USA. Oh. Um, and that's where, like, Kelly Ripa used to dance on the show, whatever. But, oh, wow. um, yeah, a lot of localized, back when dances were regional, um, you know, how they dance in Detroit is not how they were dancing in Texas. And, you know, you, you would only know when you would, like, visit cousins in the summertime, like, what kind of dance is that or whatever? So like for Detroit and, and dancing, um, can, all right, explain some, where can you, do you guys know the history of the Earl Flynn? Like, what is it? 
about the and is the Earl Flynn still a Detroit move, or is that just like one specific generation, or just even your history with dancing? Like I know in um in Batin's version of uh, Pregnant on the first Slum Village album, it's it's an interlude where he's rhyming over the 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 Roger loop. Right. You know, he's it's it's only like forty five seconds, but he literally. I read the lyrics and basically he's saying that I came to a jit like I came to a party to show them how I dance and they looking at me like I'm a weirdo and you know so See, the, the jit is a Detroit dance kind of like okay. Chicago got footwork you right know what I'm saying Detroit has its own version you know what I'm saying a little more technical than the footwork and um that's what he was talking about he said when I walk in there doing my jit they looking at me crazy you know what I'm saying? Because he jitting and he got dreadlocks. You know what I'm saying? So jitting was like a cultural thing here. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody jitted for the most part. So right. that's kind of how it worked. The Earl Flynn was like, if I ain't mistaken, T, that wasn't that like the gang, Earl Flynn? That was a gang called the Earl Flynn's. And that was their move that they used to do. To that's let where it came from? Yes, that's where it came from. It was a game. <laughs> so answer me this. Answer me this. Because around the parade album period, um, you know, I would routinely like Prince's relationship with Detroit is just on some other level. Um even when I would go back to old album credits, at least like from controversy 1999, Purple Rain, or whatever. I mean, I didn't even realize that Prince was Prince's love for Detroit. Like all of his Detroit shout outs start with what up, though, you know, and I'm like, Prince knows this speak. Like, what does Prince know? And if you watch like concerts in 86, um, assuming that this is the Earl Flynn, like where you do yes. your wave yeah, your arms course. back and forth. Yeah, Prince was ahead. routinely. So that was yeah. Prince's version of doing I guess a so, sea yeah. walk or whatever. Yeah. Do brothers feel a certain way like that, or like? No, they had, they had overwhelming love for him. See, you got to think, like you said, go back to the uh to the Mojo. Mojo broke Prince. He would play a whole Prince album on the air. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sometimes even with the curse words. And yeah, him, I was like, how does that happen? <laughs> and Prince used to call him. He would pick up the phone and call him and thank him. So they developed a relationship, you know what I'm saying, and they became really close. So he he helped he helped Prince break in Detroit, man. So you know they they became great friends, man. You know, so it's it's just a dope that that Prince incorporated so much Detroit in there. <laughs> yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. When the Roots first visited Detroit, was the second American city that we visited when we first started touring. And the place that they took us was a spot called the Hip Hop Shop. Okay. Which, I mean, by that point, Maurice Malone, you know, hip hop fashions were starting in 94, 95, starting to become a little national. It wasn't just localized, but um, was the Hip Hop Shop sort of just like a, a, a localized hub for an MC back in the early 90s or like how? Yeah. How, Talk, talk to me about the, the relationship of that that uh, well, establishment. Well, we had a few establishments, but that was one of the main ones. And that was the one that really, you know, had the, the breakout artists. You know what I'm saying? That's where Royce and, and Eminem and D12 and L and just everybody was at this spot. So this was the spot for MCs. You go there, it was only on Saturdays. They sold clothes during the week. Maurice made his own clothes and sold them. And then he let us have an open mic on um on Saturdays. It was hosted by Proof. Uh recipes to Big Proof. Yeah. And you know what I'm saying? It was just the, it was just some of the, we had some of the illest battles. Now, in Slum Village, we didn't really battle, but we used to like premiere songs and play certain joints and do stuff like that. But it was it was some dope battles there. You know, M had a few battles there, a, a bunch of people. So it was, it was, it was our spot. It was our only spot, really, at that time. We had a couple of nighttime spots, but that was the, the time. And and it was in Seven Mile, which is kind of scary. If Seven Mile, <laughs> 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 it's like a 
on Martin Luther King Boulevard, you know, type of thing. Oh, all right. So, you know, so you, you know, but at that time, it was all love. You know what I'm saying? Everybody went there, did their thing. You had some guys smoking weed in the car. You had some people drinking their little beers and then going there and do their hip hop. You know what I'm saying? And then it, it was just a dope spot for us to do so, it. So shout out to Maurice Malone for, for doing that, man, setting that up. How, so in in your opinion, like how, how, how is hip hop translated in terms of like, um, Okay, so a song like Ain't, Ain't No Future in Your Front, and like, was that just universally accepted by the entire hip-hop community? Or did, you know, was it like, okay, well, you guys are more West Coast sounding, so, you know, that's y'all's thing, and we're more East Coast sounding, so this is our thing? No, like, it was it was universal because we, we, Detroit is like the melting pot of every sound. We listen to Luke and Two Live Crew on the, on the radio, we listen to Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg. We listen to Trot, uh, Twister. <laughs> they play everything in Detroit. So it was just like a dope song. Detroit just accepted it as a dope song. It wasn't about, uh, it sounded more Cali. It was just, you know what I'm saying, represented the city as a whole. Okay. Speak on the first moment in which it's like, okay, let's let's start a group. Now, I know before it was Slum Village, the... The name was a sounds or Cinepod. Yeah, Cinepod. Yeah. All right, Cinepod. Dopeness, dopeness backwards. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> explain to me how, like, the year that starts in and, and the group in that formation. And that formation, uh, it started off like I said. I heard about these cats. Number one, we was dancing to him. But speaking of dancing, everybody in my crew danced too. By the way. You had to dance. I can hey, attest to this. Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So everybody in the crew danced. But anyway, I had heard about some cats. I had heard about Dilla and this. And I heard about Batan. For, but first, it was like me and Batan. And I got with Batan and YG first. And we had a group called Hard to Oppose, which only did two songs. But yeah, it was it was more West Coast gangster sound in a little bit. But yeah, we had those couple of songs. We did that. And then, then we heard about Dilla about the beats, and then while she introduced me to that, then we decided to do official Cinepod stuff, which means we went to the studio, um, uh, uh, Mo's studio, this hood okay. studio, and we recorded these couple of records. And one of the records had um, a Flip Wilson sample in it. So it was very zany. Oh, wow. It was that <laughs> very eloquent that is, a, is what, you, what you heard from... Uh, uh, Cinepod. So the 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 Cinepod lineup was me, uh, YG, uh, Batan, Della, Cutie. Oh wow! And, uh, Cutie was in this. Yeah, Cutie was in this because that's when Dancers was really a part of it, and Cutie started off dancing first, so he was a part of it. So um, you're saying at this point, LMS was kind of y'all North Star. Yeah, North Star between them and uh, Organized Fusion. Okay. Or the early yes but definitely lns for sure okay okay yeah so um and so we made our couple of first records um which was called rat a tat tat the sound of the whack <laughs> 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 and you know we all doing the chants we doing the chants, and uh you get a, you know all that you know all that because everybody was doing that at that right. time and uh and it was, we did a couple of records at cinepop only that before we uh, formed Slum Village. There, yeah. there are records? I said only two records. Only two records. Literally two. two well, two I'm, no, no, no. I mean like physical, like I can find this on eBay records? Ooh, no, not physical records. No, okay, y'all just made some songs. Oh, I was about to say, man. Okay. Yeah, no, no physical records. Not Exclusive. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. back then, like what was the process of making music? Like who was, because you're naming a lot of MCs and a lot of beat makers. So like, what was, what was the division of labor, at least for that particular project? Like, Oh, uh, I think YG produced one and Dilla produced one. Dilla rapped on, on and we all rapped by 10. Well, QD only did backgrounds and me by 10 Dilla rapped. Okay. And, uh, featured this one guy, um, this guy who was, a, who turned out to be an R and B singer. I forget his name. Um, uh, yeah, but 
yeah, Dwelly. I was like, who? Oh, right, right. <laughs> no, nah, I mean he underground. He didn't, he didn't blow up big, but he okay. He, uh, singer for sure. I see, and that configuration lasted for how long, and then how did it morph into the second phase of the group, which I guess is Slum Village. Um, and it maybe lasts for a few months before everybody decided at that time that you know dancing was kind of been getting played out a little bit. So maybe maybe a year, maybe dancing was getting played out a bit. So we didn't really need to dance no more. And <laughs> and 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 YG was like. Dilla's beats is incredible. I don't need to be doing no beats no more. And then it was like, well, we the only people left. So it was basically then. So we, <laughs> we was in the basement one day. and uh, Did you know it was like when you're hearing this stuff, and I, I've I've heard even in the what what we call the, the camp, the camp amp era, um, shout out to Amp Fittler, um, yeah. the camp yeah. amp era of, of Dilla's musical development um were you guys at all aware like all right this is a weird ass shit like like what kept you guys from like because the thing is is that i live in a territory and still to this day i know that a part of my production has to appease the need to please the barbershop in Tariq's head you know whereas like sometimes i want to do some crazy off-kilter shit but then I'll give it to Tariq, like, uh, he ain't going to fuck with this because it's just too weird sounding. But it's almost like, like all those, I, I think the earliest song I heard from you guys is, uh, was it Here Come the Drums or Bring the Drums or it's. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yes. Drop yes. The the right. Drums. Which is crazy shit. You know what I mean? Even, even the early demos of the songs that wound up on Fantastic were just super weird. Like. How how is there no filter for especially coming from Detroit, which I imagine you have to have a protective shell of of hardness to get respect. You guys were j just like anything goes, and if it's weird, it's dope. Like, <laughs> yes, this is true. I mean, I think, like I say, most of our albums were based on comedy, so. Just us making each other laugh is what we was really doing. So we had that. So we would, you know, when we was working our little factory jobs together, we basically laughing all day, creating ideas, using that for songs. Just, you know, so it just basically came out of humor. And it was enough of us where we felt like we could just stay in our bubble and never, you know what I'm saying? And never be a part of the real world almost. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we. We were just in our bubble, just period. So there was like, no, like, when you play it for your boys and there's no cringing, like, ah, oh, that's a demo or fast forward, like. No, all my boys was just as weird. So it was just like, we was all found each other. It was, it was a good hundred of us, eventually. But it, you know what I'm saying? But the core was like a good 10. So yeah, we, we was all just as weird. And they was like, the weirder the better. Oh man, that's, you know what I'm saying? Because to us, hip hop was all new. We didn't kind of grow up on no structure like you know, New York did when hip hop was a certain type of way. And you you know what I'm saying? It was mm -hmm. just whatever I creative you can get. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's kind of what we incorporated. How often did you guys see um, shows? Because the one thing that baffles me about Detroit is, at least for us, the reason why it's so hard for us to come to Detroit is there's really not a middle ground venue structure that a a besides St Andrews Hall, like there's you, you when you come to Detroit as a as a an established rap artist is like you start in St Andrews Hall, and then there's no middle ground. So then it's almost like the I, I forget the name of the theater that's like slightly up. Like that's a place where like Jill Scott would play. Yeah, Fillmore. Or the, yeah, or the, which, you know, we weren't exactly the 5,000, 6,000 level, you know, group. So there's no middle ground. So it's like for a long, like our Detroit shows were always like, unless we were on a festival, which was often, um, there's no venue structure. How are you getting this stuff where, at least for my first 15 years of coming to Detroit, there really wasn't nothing. Like I knew you guys 
so you guys were entertainment enough, but f- for the average person, like what do you what, what was there for culture? Well, the culture is <laughs> we're building this thing up. So, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> from from stone by stone. So you you saying uh okay, when Slum Village started coming up, we started building up our audience, but we had a literal following of people. At least we can we can get a hundred people to come to our show. You know what I'm saying? And that's why when you hear when you hear uh the look of love, you look hear of love, I was gonna ask, yeah. You you hear the audience singing it. That's just fans before we even got it got on. You know what I'm saying? Because we had right. already built up a base. We we piece by piece. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And as far as the movie theater, it was one theater in the hood that you could go to called a Bel Air. Yeah, uh, no, I didn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> I know about the Bel Air. <laughs> it was told. I used to have to catch a bus to get to it, but yeah, it's a nice theater though. But uh, yeah. That's the spot. And I knew you was a movie man because, you know, we went to the movies. Uh, One time we was on the road together somewhere. Yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. my thing. I was like, damn, nothing. What do y'all do up here? So, <laughs> all right. So can you, the thing is, is that um, when Fantastic is finally coming to fruition, so what, what's the discussion in terms of like, Let's we we got to make our own tape. And I I heard there was a rumor that you guys were initially about to sign to Ruben Rodriguez's uh, Pendulum label. Yeah, that was that was a possibility, but that was that was later though, a little bit later now. But yeah, that no, was, that was a, that was earlier before. Because uh, I think Pendulum came out in like ninety two, correct? Yeah, Pendulum is before Volume uh, Fantastic Volume One. That was oh. uh, with Pops oh, and yeah, uh, Sally. That was true. Okay, yeah, that's what happened. Well, we were signed to John Sally and his dad. They had a uh, they had a place called Hoop Studio. Okay. Um, and uh, basically, they were going to sign us. They was they was it was between us and uh, Diggable Planets. Oh wow! And- oh wow! So you- <laughs> and, wow, uh, y'all almost. <laughs> yeah. This explains yeah. it. Invisible. Like Invisible. you guys. The thing is, is that you guys sound like when I heard Fantastic, we were more amazed that like this isn't it doesn't feel like a demo. This sounds it sounds like this group has had experience before and y'all sounded like professional. Now, Fantastic winds up in my hands in like 96, 97. So even by 92, you guys were at least set or poised to make your grand arrival or whatever so yeah n- now that makes sense do you think you guys were ready for that back then or no are you glad <laughs> how it how it turned out yes absolutely because if we would have came out we had this song called is it the magic and it had the upright bass and it was it was everything you wanted a jazz slash right rap it could be it was all that you know what I'm saying? And Ab Filler was on there playing it. Shout out to Ab Filler, always showing us love. Um, yeah, so that was that was that record. Um, no, I don't think we was ready because I, I, we were still developing styles, and I just think um, we weren't ready at that time. What you think, Jay? <laughs> hey, man. All thing in due time. Yeah, that's what I say. I, I think it worked out exactly how it was supposed to. I was recently doing this uh, radio show about the. Uh, milestone records label and uh mccoy tyner specifically and the the guy who owned that label on keep news said something to the effect of um when he first met um mccoy you know mccoy was like you know you gave me this one session and then you never called me again until until later on and uh he said well back then you weren't mccoy yet you weren't mccoy tyner yet meaning you know he hadn't Right, developed his unique style, or etc. He found his voice. So when when y'all were starting out this time period that we're talking about, was Dilla Dilla yet? Is is what I'm asking. Like his earliest beats, uh, had he found what we now know as what he did? The Quest could probably answer this question I too. Think, I think I think as a as a listener, um, there were already signs of what was coming in the future. 
so sort of like and and you know I've I've got my hands on a lot of these like 92 beats 93 beats I will say that um yeah even for back then that was some really unorthodox thinking that you know I was like wow even early like I'm I'm pressed to find something that I'm like ah, that's not really whack like you, you see that he was searching for it of course he perfects it but I, I don't know that's that to me like coming out the gate it was an immediately like a jarring thing of like this isn't like how the hip hop I grew up sounding is made so but it didn't sound like an amateur making it it sounded like someone doing it on purpose right but you all recognized uh, at that even early on that that he was a special child yeah. when i heard Dillas beats i was like this it this is it early early wow. cuz first of all you think it's just you and your neighborhood like oh he's just good for your neighborhood but then you start it start branching up you like wait a minute this mm -hmm. guy is really incredible yeah, he you know good everywhere <laughs> and like you know, like i said he started off with just the pausing cassette took that was then went to this and went to that learn on it was like man i was amazed i was just happy to be alone for the ride for the most part before we even got a chance to develop what slum village would come to be i was just looking at him like how's this kid he he my age well how's he doing <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm looking right. We the same age. You know, you know what I'm saying? And he was just killing it. What year were you born, RJ? Like, how 80. old were you at the time when this is happening? 92. I'm about eight, nine years old. Okay. So it, when you're first hearing this, is it, does it hit you different? I think as an adult, it hits me different simply because. You know, I knew what the lay of the land was. For me, the lay of the land was like what Tribe was doing and what Dela was doing and what Public Enemy was doing, what Marley Maul was doing. And so Dilla's arrival is more akin to that of like Godzilla coming to town. Like, wait, what What the hell is that over there? You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> but for you to come, you know, to be much younger, it's not like you you had an established lay of the land of what, what was what once was like oh black and white television and suddenly like in the wizard of oz everything turns to color so for you though um like how are you receiving this at a at, at a young age i knew it was dope because he was producing for my kids group so he was doing some of our demos oh wow wait really for sure tell me about this i don't i didn't know this i had a group called uh first it went from Spoiled rich kids, kids you're not, you know what I'm saying? And, <laughs> kids uh, always in it. <laughs> and he was uh and he was producing the demos for us because of the studio. We was all signed. So my pops had us signed, he had Slum signed, he had uh Paul Rosenberg, Eminem's manager, was signed right. to the label. And he was he rhyming? Was, yeah. yeah, he was rhyming. I need evidence. <laughs> It was, dope. it was dope too. Paul Bunyan. What? Yes. And, and Skinny Supreme. Did it's you know this, Fonte? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> Skinny I'm, Supreme. Paul it's in uh it's in Dan's book. He talks about it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I just never heard of the music. That's all. And I never yeah. heard of the music, but I I've heard the story. Okay. Yeah, so it was all of us up there. And this Barack recordings? Nah, this is Hoop Sounds. This okay. is in ninety two when he opened the studio with, with Sally. And uh, we would go up there and I would see him. You know, I come home from school and seeing Dilla make beats in my kitchen. You know what I'm saying? So it was just like, oh, okay, this is like a big brother and I'm seeing him, you know what I'm saying, record. And then he was making demos for us. So right. I always knew, you know what I'm saying, he was dope. So who's teaching you how to make beats at this time? Like how old were you when you started messing around on machines and what what technology was at the studio i started making beats the first time i was on a dmx drum machine just programming oh, wow. in, in the drum machine okay. and i was just picking up pops equipment when i actually started producing was around the age of 13 14 uh -huh. and uh just being at the studio 
I was like, man, I might as well give it a shot. So I asked my pops and he was like, man, I'm not teaching you nothing. You know what I'm saying? Get the machine, figure it out if you want to do it. So I sat there and figured it out. Eventually the guys come to the studio. He like play him some beats. This is around like 97. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And 98. And I played them and they laughed at the beats. The Labartina T was just fell out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they like these beats funny as hell. And so <laughs> after they leave out, you know what I'm saying? Dilla like, yo, man, let me show you some stuff. So he showed me, you know what I'm saying, how to work the 3000. Okay. So I'm like, okay. So he like, work on that. And when I come back, I'm going to show you some more stuff. I want to hear what you're doing. So he would come back in, check up. Like, what you got? Okay, this is how you work the effects in the 3000 to get delays and stuff. And then eventually, you know what I'm saying, Corrupt came to Detroit, and I ended up producing some songs for Corrupt. How old were you at the time? 15. Wow. Oh, okay. So when Dilla heard the beats that I did for Corrupt, he was like, okay, now you ready. And then that's when, you know, it just, I kind of got in the mix with that and then producing on Climax with Dilla. Right. And mixing the record and all of that stuff. That's how I ended up at the video shoot with y'all. Ah, nice. Nice. Damn, so you were literally young RJ. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Literally. Okay, so one of the strangest things that, um, so can you tell me how and the the whole process of making fantastic one because for me um the th the the bomb that Dilla dropped on me was that he made the music for fantastic volume 1 after the vocals were done he was like he would just do a, a hi hat tss, 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 and you guys would just rhyme to the hi hat i don't think this is championed enough for me Yes, I know the entire world righteously salivates over Dilla's creation. But for me, the magic of that whole period was, it, it, to me, it's a, it's a marriage. It's a marriage between the beats and the rhythm to which you guys are delivering this stuff, which it, it wasn't exactly the, the, the tradition of harmonizing i.e. the Cold Crush Brothers, but you guys had such a, a, a confident, cocky presentation of, like, your background hooks and all that stuff. Yeah. How, are, how are you guys creatively, like, the thinking of these things? Course, yeah. I would say this. Um, number one, it is what happened, though. Volume one got done because a a beef, a, a dumb beef. So we was... We, it was the group Fire Ella, shout out to them. And Dilla the same had, Fire Ella that's on. You said why all y'all's on, on a day. Yeah. Yeah. Same yeah. Fire Ella. Same Wait, are y'all singing? Wait, is this five, four, three, two, one LL thing again? Are y'all like beefing yeah. with each other yeah. on the song? Yes, yes. Wait, wait, wait! I was <laughs> only playing. Are you serious? First of all, every song on Volume One is me either talk about Dilla, Dilla talk about me, or him talk about Bati. Wait, oh, what? Wait, oh, I didn't even ask guy. that question. <laughs> Wait, I'm talking about other crews. Yeah, you guys are just basically using the microphone as a pit pull, pit uh, a pulpit bully like method. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. We enjoy you you gotta give me specifics because uh, when Dylan say I'm sick, sick of niggas popping up in my crib, but he talking about all in the announcer shit. He's talking about me because this nigga he told me. He said, he'll tell you to come to his crib and then he won't answer the door. And then he'll say, I'm popping up. I'm going to pop up the crib. You told me to come. I just walked <laughs> over here. <laughs> you know I never knew this shit. Stuff like that, man. Us tons of stuff like that. Yes. And so, what, counterfeit niggas be running? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that's it's the, so I'll funny. come back. Yes, we. that's all we did all day was talk about each other on the See, first whole <laughs> volume one. You were lightly ranking on each other. Yes. Just, yeah. I mean, you know, because that's kind of niggas we was. When, Wait, know, when... so I don't know why the fuck I'm fucking with you? It, right. All this? 
her, well, that's that was a chick that the dealer was messing with. That's that it went it went it went. I ain't talking about. It. But then by ten, threw a couple of slick lines in there too, though. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All day, what we used to do. But like I said, it's it started off with a beef with them, and Dilla had produced a whole tape. Now, mind you, Slum Village didn't came out with official nothing yet. And they was bragging, like, oh, Dilla did our stuff before he did y'all. Da -da 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 Boom. So here come YG hyping us up. The first song we're going to do is Players, talking about them. That's the first song we did. Mm. Players. I, we was talking about them and this other guy from the old hip-hop scene that I was talking about personally because we was dating the same girl and he got mad and and I tried to, well, anyway, but yeah, it's something like that. So that's that's how that got. So that's how it all kind of started, you know, after that. What What is the 788? 788 is our birthdays. So I'm I'm uh, Dilla's February 7th, I'm, uh, November 8th, and, and by 10 is uh, March 8th. So it's it's just our birthdays. <laughs> and, um, you guys are weird. All right, so, <laughs> um, so so we doing this and uh what I was saying uh so I was inspired by that. So we we did we did uh we did like half of the tape to just clicks and then half we did beats. So I went off, but then even with the beats that we did, he still remixed. And he would change them. But it wasn't the same either. So, so that's how we did volume one. And we did it, like I said, we did it in a week. Because we had all these rhymes that we, and songs, you know what I'm saying? Just from 10 years of being together, you got to, we was together for a long time before we actually came kind of out. You know what I'm saying? So. Right. So what we, did y'all record? And, what did y'all record volume one on? Because it sounds like y'all just recording on like headphone mic. Like all what kind of equipment of, would y'all use? <laughs> <laughs> we recorded, we, we record part of it on headphone mics. We. Cause we had two mics, and then we had to do part of it straight to death. So it's oh, stuff straight to death. That means one takes. That means if you fuck mm -hmm. up, we had to start all over again, do it again. Cause we're doing straight to death. Then we took part over to RJ's studio and once we got some time to do that. So it's all over the place. With the it's, uh, it's going to have to roll. Fuck that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's why we it's gonna have to roll. Cause I we did it like twenty seven times. Like, oh uh, fuck that, nigga. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, I mean, but I, I enjoyed the process. And when we made it, when we made it, if you listen to me at the end, I'd be like, ooh, I already knew. Right. I already knew at the end of uh, one of them songs. Uh, I already knew it was going to be a classic. Yo, I was like, ooh, this is it. So, so, question. All right. I always wanted to know this. And I know I'm, like, asking you to remember, like, inside jokes from, like, almost 30 years ago. But so on Fat Cat song. Or at least at the end of how we bullshit. After listening to this song for like twenty five years, I listened. I listened to uh, "Fantastic" like its entirety last night for the first time in like maybe like eh, maybe for like five years. Like it's it's been a minute since I just sat down and list, listened to any album in its in in its entirety. Um, but it finally hit me. I. Am I correct in assuming that you guys were ranking? My assumption is that you guys, at the time that you recorded it, the Soul Train Awards must have just came on because you're obviously talking about Escape, like at the very beginning. Like you guys are trying to remember their name. You're like, you know, the group that sings, get back your seat, relax it. Right. But then there's a moment where... I believe that you guys are mocking Color Me Bad's first single of their sophomore album, Time and Change. Yeah. yeah. Time. That is true. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Because everything, everything was comedy. That is I, true. I only know this because I guess they were... Do you, all right, do you remember the second album that Color Me Bad did, Fonte, where... Yeah, Time and Change, yeah. Yeah, where they, they uh, decided to enlist... Bootsy and the P Funk All Stars as their band. Oh, I missed that part. Like it was really weird. Like anywhere they were going, like literally, like I'm looking at Gary Mudbone Walker and Bootsy Collins and Catfish, wow. but just be side guys to call me bad. Not like hey, like at least in delight. 
like delight was like, yo, y'all, we got Bootsy's Ru- rubber band as our band. But literally, I saw I saw a performance on the Soul Train Awards. Finally, I looked it up, and I believe that that's what you guys were mocking because. <laughs> like at, at no point did, did did you guys think that that was ever going to get out or get back to them or anything like that? So I think I think we thought we was being so coded that people was going to really be like, ah, oh. you know what I'm saying? You know, it what took I'm me a minute. We <laughs> as, as possible, we tried to be coded, and that was and that was uh, shout out to Frank Nick. That was Frank Nick that was saying that too. That was Frank Nick um, for real. Okay, yeah. so yeah, man. I mean, like I said, everything was based on jokes, comedy. I don't know why we decided to say that before the song that uh, that we was getting ready to record. I, I right. Joke, but we just kept it. Like, oh, okay. So, you know. what was your what was your level of shock that not only is this going to take off in your city, but at what point do you realize that this cassette demo? might actually be not only hip hop's most important creative shift um very quietly though i mean not like in terms of dr dre like turning the whole world around with the sound of the west coast the g funk sound but at what point do you realize that this thing is going to be bigger than just something local or something that's dope for hip hop, but almost like damn near a, a, its own genre or a way of life. Like, at what point does that hit you? Uh, it's gonna be, be, believe it or not, it's once we got that demo or that volume one to Q Tip's hands, right? And, and he started calling this person and people like you and then people like D'Angelo. And all of these people saying, oh, man, that's what I'm looking like. Okay, these are people that I admire. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And I love their music. And, and that's when you know, okay, I, we do got some legs. You know, you know what I'm saying? We got something to stand on. But you know how long that takes because it's word of mouth. First of all, you had to mail the tape. Remember you had to? Hey, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And okay, now you got to wait. Then they got to listen to it. Then they right. gotta play the same boy. Y'all ain't in the same state. So he but Q tip single handedly played it for everybody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, he did. Uh I I can attest that um the first time I heard Fantastic Volume One, um I was in Germany and living off of per diem and weekly stipends. So, you know, like you know, to 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 be a, a broke starving musician living on about three hundred and seventy five dollars a week on your own to fend for yourself and the temptation you know to pick up the phone to call the United States long distance for twenty five <laughs> minutes right right no literally like I told them like set up a microphone to the speakerphone I want to hear this whole entire thing. That was that was that was a one hundred and sixty eight dollar wow. phone call that I could not afford. And <laughs> wow. Wow. My, no, seriously, I, I was like, OK, I can live off of palm frites. There, there's a joke in the roots community. Palm frites, buku tomat. Um, yeah. Usually after midnight when bodegas or, or like uh those those like late night spots that are about to close right before they close they might like sell the che- food for cheap so when you're touring europe you know you'll go to the kebab dude and yeah. he'll cut off half the price so i was like negotiating my meals like i can live off of street wow. street kebabs buku tomatoes and palm frites and at the venue i knew i was good for a turkey sandwich like you know they give you food at the venue so Nah, man, I, I I had to starve one week for some slum village <laughs> over the telephone. Is it jarring to and he, and this is the thing that I noticed. I I noticed, and you know, I, I explained to this in Dan's book. Um, because D'Angelo will go through this. Um, I seen Dilla go through this. I see a couple people go through it. Where I think the general rule is like, 
you know, pioneers are supposed to be like at least 20 to 40 years older than the next generation. So, you know, in the way that like D'Angelo looks at Prince or Marvin Gaye, then of course, okay, that's the natural essence. Like that's the natural evolution of life. Like he's going to be influenced by them. But it's a little bit different when your pioneer uh, is might be five years older than you. Or in this case, your pioneer won't even get their turn to bet until five years after you, you know. So is it jarring to be in this bubble that's so influential in which... Uh on one hand, people are embracing you, but on the other hand, it's almost like we get to sample and taste the the fruit of the nectar, yeah, the the nectar of of, of the fruit before you yourself get to enjoy that. Well, it's it's a lot. It was a lot for us. Number one, out the gate, we got we got kicked in the in the in the rump because huge have decided. When he we did finally get him on the record day, he wants to use our record as a platform to leave hip hop. Right. So, I anyway, when I heard that verse, I was like, wait a minute. Right. <laughs> so guess what New York said to Slum Village? Boom! You you got rid of Tribe Called Quest. I like, no, I didn't. I just wanted a verse. Right. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I just wanted a verse. I didn't know when I went down there, he was talking. I was walking with q to down the street. We was going to Saburro's Pizza. And we was going to some studio or something after that. And, and he was like, man, you know, I'm really thinking about quitting, man. I'm I'm out. And, and then he loops up the, the original whole tight. Oh, mm -hmm. tight, tight. Right. And he starts spitting these sentimental lyrics. It, it's something <laughs> about this group that makes people want to, you know, some, some sort of cath catharsis release that happens. <laughs> <laughs> that makes everybody confrontational on a slum village uh uh cassette. I remember one of the earliest arguments I had with um we were just talking about we were going through song for song and you know I was explaining that uh the frustrating thing about making things fall apart was the fact that um Malik and just his very weird Malik's almost like Batman like M Malik shows up to the studio at like 3 a.m like when the engineer's just cleaning up and ready to go home and he would always just come in at like odd hours 1 30 a.m 2 30 a.m and look on the floor go to the corner and read he would read the reels off like okay what do they work on today and the assistant engineer don't know so he's just like well here's Amir's beats he were making here's da, da 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 and Malik would just be like hey put one of them things up now the thing is is that you know I'm also using this album period like you know there's other projects I'm working on but I'm also using this album period to um develop my sound or try to figure out what my sound is as a producer and so I'm practicing stuff that Dill is teaching me like he taught me shit on the 1200. I didn't know he taught me stuff on my MP. So it's almost like you go through a period as a beat waker. And I'm sure that you know about this, RJ. Like you go through this period as a beat maker where you need to practice first and emulate. Like first I did the bomb squad. Then, all right, I'm going to practice this Molly Mall track. And then I'm going to practice this premiere track or whatever. Like you got to practice before you start. And, and the thing was, Malik would always he would do complete songs to shit that I never intended for the public to hear. And I told, it was hitting me that I was hell bent. I was like, yo, there's no way that I'm going to let my slum influence out on this roots record. And it would only happen when like Malik would just unknowingly take some shit that I had no intention for y'all to hear. A good example is like, uh, the table content song that that intros the album or the don't see us we see you like shit i never intended for the public to hear so for you though like again is is it is that weird like 
to know that you're that that influential like you're a pioneer before you're an artist yourself uh yeah uh, yeah i mean i mean i'm definitely thankful but man i don't know man i have to thank dilla of course and i would have to thank all of my mentors man like and fillers and filler rj rice i mean we had a lot of people that was that was really just looking out for no reason at all you know what i'm saying which was right different was you know what I'm saying for me especially for me I didn't even grow with a father so you telling me this random dude named Adam and Philly gonna let you come in his house you know make some <laughs> you know what I'm saying and, you know, right. rap and do all of this just because he want to make sure we ain't in the streets doing no foolishness you know what I'm saying so right. it was like we had we had the community the whole slum village as, as you will <laughs> that, that was helping us you know what I'm saying okay really I, RJ, I wanted to ask you, man, specifically, um, with your dad being, you know, who he was in the game and, you know, just having that base for RJ's latest arrival, what were some of the things he taught you? Uh, you talked about musically, but, like, mm -hmm. business-wise, what were there any principles or just kind of things that game he gave you that kind of helped you in your journey? Uh, he always taught me to be a man of your word. You know, don't be quick to say yes. Take time to think on it. So you know that's something that you're gonna deliver on. He also taught me never take a man's dignity. You don't wanna uh, put a man in a position of where he got a bed or, and never wait to pay a man. You know what I'm saying? Because he got a family that he's taking care of as well. You know what I'm saying? And he waiting on that money to come just like you waiting on the money to come. So, you right. know what I'm saying? It's a lot of Jews that he that he taught me with, with how to do business and you know cultivating relationships and things like that. You know, some things you may have to do for free. You know what I'm saying? In order to grow the, the business. So, you know, it, it's a lot. You know, I thank them all the time. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't have had a better father mentor. You know what I'm saying? And I enjoy working with them too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. Look, is your mom, she still sing? She still sing. They just put a new song out. They okay. just dropped a new song. Yeah. That's what's up, man. So can you talk about... um? the transition to um, trying to get a, a deal with the major with Interscope, like after the, after the, the, the initial pebble was thrown for fantastic volume one to expand uh, the, the, the whole ordeal, you know, something um, I don't even know if you know this um, T3. Uh, I found an audio recording it's the craziest thing I ever heard in my life. Um, it's an audio recording. And I guess uh, I can, ass I'm assuming that you're holding a video camera. You guys oh. are in a car together. And this is the only, I only know the audio part of it. And you, Dill is driving and you ask him a question. You say, hey man, what's the day? Oh, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know about this? Okay, yeah. it's it just it yeah, yeah. jars me every time I hear it. You you're like, hey, what's the day, man? And Dill's like, oh, I don't know, Thursday. He said, Nah, man, what's the day? And Dill is like, Oh, okay, it's it's February tenth. He's like, Yeah, and what's the day? He's like, Yeah, man, February tenth is the first day that we're making our new album, Fantastic Volume Two, baby. Da, da, da. And y'all just talk about it. Yeah, and yeah. man, I'm just like it 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 really I was like, wow, just you know, because for a lot of us, February 10th being the day of his transitioning is such a you know, such a thing for those that that you know follow his music so closely. But just can you just talk about just the excitement, but to hear that clip and the excitement of you guys like talking about your future. And all those things, like, would that often happen? Uh, yeah. I mean, we, 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 we had to. You got to understand this. First of all, Slum Village had to wait for Dilla to blow, cause Dilla is, you know what I'm saying. So I was still kind of hungry and broke, man. Ten and Dilla was right. he making money already. You know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So we had to wait on that. So we had to be patient. So for the day for us all to come together and say, this is the official day 
uh, for us to work on this. Shout out to Wendy Goldstein, who was who was lacing a lot of us at that time. <laughs> Trust me, I know. <laughs> Wendy Goldstein was <laughs> yeah, that was my saving grace too. Yes, that's what I'm saying. She she laced us all, and uh, and you know we we got that opportunity to really just go in there and do it. And guess what? We had no guidance. You know, you know what I'm saying? They just let us do what we want to do, and which is beautiful. You know what I'm saying? And shout out to RJ now for, for solidifying, solidifying that deal. I wish, I wish, now I think about it, we had a couple of deals on the table. I I wanted to go with Dev Jam in my heart because we did have a, a possible situation with Dev Jam, but we decided to go with who we went with. with really? Our, yes. So there was a Def Jam deal on the table and yeah. Interscope and any other labels or? Uh, it, was, it was about five, I think, Universal's. Okay. Yeah, um, we had some deals, but we just chose what we chose. And I think we went with AM first, which was yeah. terrible. Most <laughs> love. Did you guys did you guys at all work with um John McLean? John McLean is the one who got who was like part of getting the deal at AM. John, John McLean is one of those figures that you know, even I'm working on the slide doc right now, and he's a part of Sly's eighties, you know, uh attempted several attempts to come back or whatnot, but he's one of those brothers that's so elusive in terms of like talking to the press or whatever. What like what what were your interactions like with John McLean? Well did you interact with him through? I didn't have many. I was mostly your dad and management talking to him. I, I was really brief the okay. Indian I had. So that was mostly RJ and Tim Tim Maynard, um, mostly spoke to him most of the time. I okay. was out of business. I was such a, a studio nerd. I was, that's what I was at. How did that deal fall apart? Because I <sighs> thought I saw a tangible version of what I thought was a fantastic volume two on Interscope. Later found out there was a bootleg or whatever, but how did that... I'm going to tell you how it fell, fell apart. This is how... No disrespect, but what happened was corrupt. He decides to do a double album. Oh no. Corruption <laughs> joint. The yeah. West versus the East. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That album shut down the whole rap department because the lack over of budget. Respect. Yes. Oh, and guess boy. who was coming right next after that? It was Slum Village. Right. So it was oh. Then the bootleg on top of that, it was like, well, the only thing we could do, I guess we're going to go start touring in Europe. So we was able to tour in Europe in 99. That was super early for us to go down there, do our first European tour, which was an ordeal, too, because Dilla act like he left, uh, lost his passport for a while because he didn't want to go because he had to finish some remixes. It was like, right. was just going through Oh, I it. can't find my passport. <laughs> oh, shit. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i was about to say how so this is also the period in which like he's gonna leave the group or whatever how so explain how you go through the second uh like just the adjustment readjusting the group without him on stage with you well he he, he didn't he said he would do select shows he was going to he was going to do the uh west coast he was going to do detroit Maybe something else. And that was right. all he was even when we was doing the okay player unit. You, need, you right. know what I'm saying? So well, we, we got him for two shows at least. Right, right, right. We got him for two shows. Right. So that's all he was gonna do because he wanted to catch up with all his work at right. that time. You know what I'm saying? Because he was hot and people wanted those those remixes like ASAP. So you know, he was doing all that, then he was producing on different albums. So he, he just wasn't there. Now the whole thing when he decided to leave. You know what I'm saying? We had a brand new deal on the table. Right. You know what I'm saying? With That was the whole capital deal. So it was like, where are you going? We got a whole situation. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But he decides to go and do, does the MCA deal. You know what I'm saying? And with Frank and Dank and, and get his own label situation popping over there. So, I mean, he said and told me, man, you, T, you have to take over the group, man. I did not want to. Because I enjoy being the middleman, by the way. You know, less pressure. I can right. just go 
I want two and be gone. You know what I'm saying? I'm out. You know, so it was it was hard to restructure. So one of the main pieces I had is is all the people at the studio, and one of the main people was was Young Jay. So me and him was already bonding over beats and doing stuff, and then by ten, you know, was barely showing up. Kind of mm -hmm. like what you're dealing with with Malik B. You don't even know what he gonna record to. The most exactly. stuff <laughs> that that we wasn't even working on. You know what I'm saying? Right. He, yeah. Okay. He had this machine in the back, and he would just make songs all day in these machines from the randomest beats. I don't know, you know, someone was YG, someone was this, someone was that. You, you just didn't know. And we tried to piece this album together. Um, and it was it was a difficult process. You know what I'm saying? But we, we got right. through it. You know, luckily, that's how we got uh, close with Kareem and Kareem contributed and yeah. Young Jenny and Black Milk, you know, coming up, up and all this at one time. And, you know, I had to Mix it up. I had to make some magic. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask you, man. I had the uh, I had the blessing to, uh, before he passed uh, to talk with Batin. Um, I interviewed him. This has been this has been years ago, and um, he talked very openly about like his like mental illness and just kind of the things he was struggling with. How do you manage that? I mean, navigating a group is hard enough as it is. How do you manage that? Having someone in your group that has those kind of specific uh, problems. How did y'all navigate that as a crew? Well, number one, when you're young like me and we was, you think, okay, he's just eclectic. You know what I'm saying? He's just <laughs> right, right. You don't think it's something clinical, right? You know, right. You know, he, sure. like that. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. so once I figured out that it was a real situation, it, we was at the climax. We did the climax video, and his sister had a had a, 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 a spell or whatever that we had to shut down, you know, with a video and, and it was crazy. Is it Tina? Is it, is it Tina, Tina Marie? Is that yeah. Yeah. Tina? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So on the record, she had a spell, man. We had to shut down. This. It was, it was, it was a bit much. I've never seen anything like that. It scared the daylights out of me. You know what I'm saying? Wait, it when you guys were shooting the climax video in LA, in LA when I came? Yeah. Oh yeah. shit. I didn't even know. Okay. Yeah, she had a whole spell, and then she, and then I knew it was uh, bipolar schizophrenia, and uh, and we rigged out it ran in the family, mm, you know, wow. about ten even, and so I didn't really know. Like I said, I just thought he was eclectic. Then it just got worse and worse, and to the point where it was, it was, it was a bit much. Till, till we had to have a whole handler, kind of like ODB. You had to have a handler with with ten. Okay, mm -hmm. this, this is your job, cutie. Follow him everywhere he go. I remember one time, this guy, we about to go on stage. I'm talking about 10 minutes before we go on stage. He decides to go grocery shopping. Like. Word. Yeah. And this is after, this is, you talk about, this is after Fantastic Volume 2 is out. This this so, Trinity yeah. time. It's oh, Trinity, Y'all yeah. on Capitol already. Yeah, we on Capitol. Yes, yes. It just got worse and worse, man. But, Can I? Know, did he did he have a reaction at all to um I always wanted to know if um because people often ask us like you know what was Malik B's response to water when he heard it but um Elza's verse in, in reunion did he ever respond to that or you know yes he they they talked they talked on the side of the building he uh Elza even talked to him before they he put out the verse okay so we were so and at this time, by 10 was kind of not doing so well. And he kind of showed up at the show on the side of the door, like like what else said. Right. And you know what I'm saying? And it was it was it was a tough situation. That's that's the reason why I brought Tim back in the group afterwards, because I just wanted him to try to get himself together, you know what I'm saying? Take this medication because um I learned in the music biz, there is a lot of people who struggling and just deal with it every day. It's real. Like a lot of us are carrying a lot of uh, what, what they call epigenetics um, kind of passed down through generations. Your great great grandfather had something and now your grandfather has and your father has and, and so on and so forth. I always wanted to know um, where you guys really did have like your moment in the sun, especially like with, with Detroit, Detroit Deli and with Trinity. I mean, you have something that even the Roots can't claim, which is like you got fully embraced by like the 106 in Park audience and 
there's a moment where it's almost slum village without you know without the the I mean, whether you look at it as an eclipse or a shadow of of Dilla versus oh Dilla's group, where you guys on your own are about to, you know, find an audience, find a home, find a, a groove and a movement. Where did it feel like like with the with the success of of Tainted and and also working with like Kanye on um Selfish. Selfish. Yeah. Can you talk about that period? Yeah. Um number one, it was the it was a hurt feeling for me, man, for, 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 be, uh, you know, I'm not having Dilla a part of it. I remember to get a touchdown, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a, okay, I see what you mean. Not, not officially part. I mean, we made sure he produced records on it. We was going to do that. But like when we did the video shoot for Selfish, you know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, you know, it was a glorious day. It was 300 women there. It was ridiculous. <laughs> You know, you got Kanye, you got John Legend. And then I was like, man, I heard Dilla was here. I didn't even get a chance to talk to Dilla. It was so many people, so much going on. You know what I'm saying? And I, I just felt that detached that I never wanted to feel with him. You know what I'm saying? Kind of like Perfect strangers. Oh, yeah, you know, but, you know, I'm happy I'm, I made it in a good space. But at that time, I wanted it to be what it was. But, you know right. what I'm saying? Um, but it couldn't be. You know what I'm saying? So it was, it was, I was always like that, man. Every time I had success with Slum Village, I would always be like caught in, into some weird uh, or some situation where it was a conflict. Like, I can't even enjoy this. You know, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. I'm just not getting to a space now with Slum Village, with me and Jay, where I can, I enjoy what I do. You know what I'm saying? And kind of do that. But it took a while because it was just so many, so much conflict. It was always something new every yeah. day. You know what I'm saying? Oh, see, but yeah, the thing to... was this though, three, because when you were shooting, like I called Dilla to come to the uh selfish video shoot. So when he get there, we watching him shoot. And he like, yo, man, y'all good. Y'all don't need me no more. And I'm like, bro, what is you talking about? Shit, what we doing? You, you the foundation. We always gonna need you. Right. He's like, nah, nah, y'all need me no more, man. You know. And I'm like, he had just got out the hospital. I'm like, this weird, you know what I'm saying? But you rolling with it. So it was like things along the way, you know what I'm saying? Now he was saying to kind of like, I don't want to say like prepare everybody for what mm -hmm. I think he felt was coming. So, mm -hmm. but that was like the last time that I saw him in person where, you know, everybody was there and able to kick it and have fun. Yeah. Man, I wanted to ask y'all, what was the, the how did it come about with bringing Elza in the group? Well, well, let me tell you this. <laughs> that, that, that was a necessity. Okay, so here's the situation. I'm managing Elza. That was, that was my artist at the time. So I'm managing. Oh, I did not know this. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm managing. That's my artist. And, you know, I'm about to put him out next. I'm about to get, get him going. Cool. So at that time, then then I Dilla tell me he leaving. So I'm like, okay. And and then we got a big deal with Capital all at the same time. So they expecting us to um to pull off an album, you know, and they gave us a two album deal. So I was like, well, I can't turn down this money. I can't turn down this situation. I can't, I can't, I can't. So then on top of that, by 10 wasn't showing up for the studio. <laughs> I'm like, man, I can't make the. I'm, I'm telling, R, I'm telling R. J. Rice, I'm like, man, I can't make an album by myself, man, and call it Slum Village. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I cannot. So I was like, man, I'm gonna have to bring L in, man. I'm gonna have to bring L in, and he just gonna have to fill in. I'm gonna have you do so many songs, L. You just can come in. It's gonna be your. You can do it, go in the group, and you can bounce off this, and you can come in. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, man, cool. I'm with it. You know what I'm saying? It was, it, you know, uh, he still wanted to have his rough and rugged persona. He so some of the girl records I had to convince him on a little bit mm -hmm. that he didn't want to do. <laughs> but yeah, he uh, didn't want to do Tainted. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, he didn't want to do that. Because uh, he was trying to still be, you know, that lyrical spiritual guy. And and, and nothing wrong with that. But but we had to make some records. 
because we had to get, you know, right. we got to get footing as long as that you right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm sitting there and, and you know, we pulling it together. I'm finding these new producers, Black Milk, uh, Kareem Benz, um, B.R. You know, Gunner. B.R. Gunner coming through. The whole squad, you know, I'm I'm producing. We we just pulling it together, man. You know what I'm saying? And Dilla say go give us some beats. But then when that happened, he goes and remix all the beats I chose. Really? <laughs> that, that I, you know what I'm saying? So it it was just a lot um, when we did that record. So you know what I'm saying? That was a producer um that y'all had uh, that was I don't know if he was in the camp, but I would see his credits on stuff. Ron E. Ron Estill. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Was that yeah. who was his? I know he did the the uh the Bahamadia joint um uh that y'all was on. Yeah, what what's the deal with him? Is he still making records? Like who was he? Uh Ron Ron Estelle was uh Dwelle's you might as well say like signed to Dwelle. You know, Dwelle was signed to him. You okay. know what I'm saying? So he was like a guy that produced back in the day and um had produced some records and Stuff that Stella didn't want to do, you know what I'm saying? He'd be like, you know, I ain't doing it. And then he'd be like, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. You know what I'm saying? So right. Dilla would like pass off the work. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, RJ, when BR Gunner, that was you and Black. Y'all were production team at that time. Correct. Yeah. Wait a not, minute. Not time at out. Trinity time. Not at Trinity time. Right. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, but um, yeah, y'all were production team at that time. How did y'all come to work together? And what was y'all collaboration process like as producers? For me, me and Black met through um that kids group that I had. Kids, right. you not right. the guy that was closest to my age was in a group with Black Milk, and he played me some of their songs over the phone. One of the songs I, that I heard was the beat for "What Is This." And I was mm. like on oh, Trinity, and I, mm. and I was like he, he should come up. And then he had another relationship through by ten, you know what I'm saying. So everybody had kind of like was like okay, he came up there. We started working um, through like mixing the, the records and stuff like that. By the time we was done with uh, Trinity, me and him was like friends, you know what I'm saying. So we was like shit, we doing all the work. We might as well just make a production team, you know what I'm saying and get it cracking because we're doing all the work yeah. and then that's kind of how we are going to start it and then it just kept going wait i'm one second years old i didn't realize that br gunner was a black milk and young rj yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 i actually thought br i was going to say wait how come no one's mentioning br gunner right now like <laughs> <laughs> i'm probably the only person i know that actually spins uh late eighties in my set. Is there a longer version of the late eighties uh sketch that that was on um Trinity? Uh no, uh <laughs> that's on Detroit Deli. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it is. It's in a uh in one of the machines that T was talking about because we recorded oh, but that also, on like yeah. a digital machine. I forgot. There's two versions. There's two versions. The one on Trinity. Yes, that's the one I'm speaking of. Yeah, 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 it's on the machine in the, okay. in the back. Yeah, yeah, with, with QD, right? With QD on that one, and uh, and your mother, right? Same and Dwelle, and Dwelle, yeah, yeah, Dwelle. yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that, yeah. That's my that's my shit, man. <laughs> and also, uh, the uh, the original version. All right, all right, so the the version of "Fall in Love" that is the hidden track on Trinity, the one yeah. based on the remix. That to me, like, what happened to uh, Samia? Was her name Samia? Samia, yeah, I'm sorry, Samia. Uh, with well, Samia, well, well, yeah, that happened. We we was gonna do this group called the S Band, which was Slum Village's band, right? And Samia was a part of it, and uh, and we was working on some records. I was working on some records. Me and her worked on that record. Me, her, Vernon, and Jay worked on that, producing that record. Um, but, um, what happened was, I think it just got mixed up because I was, um, I was, uh, kind of dating her and that, and that kind of got mixed things up a little uh, bit. Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> In, you know, after, um, the, the self-titled album comes out, um, 
the 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 one in two thousand five. Call me's on that, right? The the Isley Brothers joint. Yeah. Woo. That's my shit, man. I, I love it. No, I'm even even post that like, and again, I know that some people are just like only Dylan Fish or not, whatever. No, like the entire Slum Village canon to me is like there's so much magic on all these records though. Like, how for you though, T three, um, with what's happening and especially with the transitioning of Dilla and Baten, um, and with Elzai's uh, dismissal of the group and whatnot, like, how's this weighing on your mental? Like. Do you feel at some points maybe the universal universe is telling you like, well, maybe I should do something else? Da, 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 da. Like, what is it that's keeping you still in fighting shape and wanting to keep this this thing alive until you know you say it's done? You know what? I don't. You know, I did go through a turn where I was kind of going through my thing for a minute, kind of down and out. But I luckily I had a nice support group, man. Um, shout out to uh. To his dad, Big RJ, uh -huh. and, and RJ, they helped me out a lot, man. You know what I'm saying? To the point, you know, where where I just went through it. You know, I lost everything for a minute. My girlfriend, everything. I just lost my house, the place I live, and they really just helped me. You know, helped me get myself back together. You know what I'm saying? So it did weigh on me a lot. You know what I'm saying? And it broke me down for for a millisecond. But you know what I'm saying? Um. But you know we kept working, man. And, you know, luckily I had some brothers with me to help me out, man. And 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 that's and that's how I got through it, man. You know what I'm saying? But it was it was tough for a second. Jay, you remember them days when we was trying to put that uh stuff together? <laughs> for sure, I do. I definitely do. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. I was gonna ask you, uh, ask y'all, man. So me and Black Milk, uh, we had a conversation. This was a, a while back, but we were just talking about how with Slum Village, we were talking about kind of the difference between y'all and, and LB and like how y'all, because y'all had those two records on Capitol and y'all had those two big singles and how that translated, I guess, across touring. How did how did that show up for y'all on y'all side? Like, were y'all able to see a difference when it's like you do your set and then all of a sudden you do Selfish and people are like, oh, that's the one we know. Or they do Tainted and it's like, oh, that's the one. Or over time, was it people where they die hard, it's like, yo, we want volume two, we want, you know, volume one. Like, how how did that look for y'all, you know what I'm saying, as a group that had that major label experience? It looked just like you said, you had a divided group of folk. You had wow. these die hard volume two people. <laughs> <laughs> There's also volume one people too. Right. <laughs> and then you had these two big singles and they didn't always mix together. Really? You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, but and that's how it was. So we and then they would put us in different venues and different situations to see where we fit. Like one tour we'd be with somebody extra hip hop, and then mm -hmm. we did a tour with NDRE, which was like Oh you know, Lord. It was, it was not <laughs> the best way to village, by the way. Where do we come in in this? I don't even know <laughs> what to do, really. You know what I'm saying? So it was oh. a lot. People don't know what our place is because of what Selfish did or what Tainted did. You know, speaking, but that wasn't us, though. Speaking but of which, was, man, speaking of which, um, I got to I gotta talk about Cloud9, man. Yo, just how the anger I had. So I had to do this tour once in which Marsha is doing about 30 dates with us. And it's one of them things where, like, she sends an MP3 to my phone, like, this is the song I want to do. And I'm listening. And I'm like, oh, shit. I got to play this every goddamn night. It, it's <laughs> one of the most nightmarish loopings of gospel drumming. Either, like, way past the end of Jay-Z showing what you got. Like, for mm -hmm. anything that I've ever clowned <laughs> Just Blaze for about that, this is this is past any like rush Stuart Copeland like it's the craziest thing I, 
Can you talk about that? That tra- like, what made y'all want to do this? This group and their knack for picking the most unorthodox shit ever to rhyme over. <laughs> it was one of those things where uh, we was in Detroit working, and um, a guy that who was around at the time, Scrap Dirty, uh, Scrap, yeah, was, was like, "Yo, here goes uh, Marsh is out." Focus had sent it over because he had produced it. Shout out to Focus, man. Yes. So we uh-huh. like, man, this shit is crazy. We need this. And he was yeah. like, I mean, it already came out, though. And we was like, man, we don't care. And then <laughs> we reached out to Focus. And he was like, yeah, shit, y'all can go ahead and use it. And he sent it. You know what I'm saying? And everybody liced it. Yeah, yeah 10 came to yeah, we had a fun time with that. And we got a chance to perform in the cup a couple of times with Marsha Live. Yeah. 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 And that's he, a funky record. That's a funky No, nah, I love that record. It's man. funky, but it's a drummer's nightmare. So, <laughs> yeah. so every jam session, I'm like, get her backup drummer, because I ain't doing those roles ever again in this lifetime, man. That I wanted to ask y'all specifically about scheming, man. Um, y'all were able to get, you know, Daylight and yeah. uh, and Fife. You know what I'm saying? And just really kind of bring it, make it complete. How did y'all put that together, man? Scheming started out uh, as a young RJ record. I was okay. making a solo record in the midst of doing Slum. And then they ended up hearing the record and was like, this is crazy. So T was like, man, this is how I think we should do it. I think we should do it where, because T wrote the hook. And he was Not like, I think we scheme. should do it. Yeah. yeah, he was like, "Man, we should do it where Daylight saying something, and then maybe somebody else is saying the hook, and somebody else is saying it, and then we just start reaching out because I had done the Forever record for Daylight, so I was able to uh, yeah, pick yeah. up the phone and call. You did Forever? I did Forever and Morning Rise. God damn! <laughs> to this day, we still close our show with Forever, man. That is that is one of my favorite. Ah, that's that's one of my favorite like top ten songs ever, man. I love that shit, man. For you as a creator, as a beat creator, um, especially, you know, the last the last of a Mohicans, you know, I mean, I, I put you up there, Milk up there, Riggins up there, you know, there's some cats in Detroit that that are doing their thing as well, but like in 2023. How how foreign is the the lay of the land for you at least, um, in terms of where hip hop is today musically and where people are going, and like how do you adjust to it? Like, what's your process of creating records now? Like, at at this point, it's like it's not a lot of inspiration. I'm gonna keep it a hundred. It's not a lot of inspiration out there to be like. Yeah, this is crazy. Let me go in the studio and work for the most part. Unless you digging, you know what I'm saying? And you right. just kind of know, like, okay, this dope artist just dropped something on the underground scene or something. But like I was talking to Black at our show in Detroit, and I was like, bro, we all we got to inspire each other. Listen. Like, you know, if we're not gonna, if you're not gonna <laughs> make that shit or everybody ain't gonna, you know, go in there and we ain't gonna bounce ideas, what else do we have for inspiration? So it's just kind of like when I go in there, I'm just making what I want to hear. I'm I'm past the point of trying to please people musically. Mm-hmm. I'm like, if if I'm gonna throw it up there, then it's just gonna be something that a piece of art, and that's how I treat it. And it, either you get it or you don't. And that's just kind of where me and T at now, even we're working on these new records, is like we create an art that we want to do that we feel ain't there, and y'all get it or y'all don't. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. I want to uh, ask y'all as well, man, with your, the new single that y'all got out. And, bro, like, how did you hook up with the dramatics? Like, where, what was that like? Oh, we got hooked up with the dramatics through, uh, that's Pops, because he okay. was touring and all of that stuff and, and mixing and mingling, and him and Ron Banks had a super close relationship. Okay. On top of that, at the time, T was dating her daughter. I mean, his daughter. 
at the time. Okay. So, you know, we just kind of, he would come up to the studio all the time, telling stories, him and Pops would be talking shit. And then, you know, it just kind of got to the point where he was like, yo, you know, y'all should record something. So the first record we we did with the dramatics was uh, Do Our Thing. Mm -hmm. That was on prequel to a classic. And okay. Kareem Riggins produced it. And then from that, we did the BR Gunner record. And then after that, we did some other songs and we just set on vocals. So it's like songs that I got with the dramatics with LJ, Ron, uh, and all the original members that we just holding on to vocals. Did they uh, tell you of any of their experiences or stories or whatnot? Um, <laughs> yeah, probably oh, like yeah. four, three or four years ago. I didn't realize um, the the movie Detroit yeah. was about the dramatics, even at the time when um, we we did a song on that record. So when um, we got sent over uh, a copy of the movie to see it, I didn't realize like that the dramatics went through hell for sure to become yeah. who they were. Um, it, but I'm always hearing the, there's even an, in, even in Snoop's first cover story for the s source, there's a, a brief shootout moment that happens and the dramatics have, they're like coming back. The sort source story starts with them leaving the video shoot for doggy dog world. Hmm. And it just goes like they've been in the craziest situations whatsoever. Have have they ever showed shared these stories with you guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, you know, a lot of drug use, a lot of drinking. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know, he would he would just come up there and kick it and, you know, talk about the riots and, you know, what he experienced seeing and living through that and, you know, what it was like going from the big stage to doing smaller shows that was like uh less people but they would do multiple shows a night you know what i'm saying so mm -hmm. he was just saying like the adjustment period of that and you know like how to keep a group together and members leaving and you know all of that those is all the things that you know what i'm saying we would talk about and you know they would give advice on yeah man i wanted to uh, ask you about one of my favorite records of yours that that you did you did a record for Pooh. This was back when you and Pooh were working together. This is, I mean, God, 20, 2008, 9, something. This is years ago. But uh, you did a record for him called What We Are. We ended up putting it on the left back record, but it was originally a solo jump for him. And um, I love that song, man. Um, like, you bodied that shit. Um, just talk about kind of like the production of that song. And um, one thing I always admired about you, you would always incorporate you would incorporate live instruments, but it would sound like a sample. It would sound like mm -hmm. something that was vintage. Um, how was how did you uh, achieve that in in the studio? Was that something that you kind of had in mind, or how did that it, come? It's it's it started off, uh, you know, with the sample. You know what I'm saying? That was chopped up, and then um, I I had a drum set set up. You know what I'm saying? At mm -hmm. this at the house, and then I just got to a point where I was just would get on the kit and play and then have musicians come over and add bongos and all that stuff and turn it into a jam session. You know what I'm saying? Because at a certain point, music was like getting stiff. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, you know, we just, we was cranking our stuff. And then I wanted to make sure Pooh had some joints, you know what I'm saying? So I was like super locked in and focused. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I, I felt like me and Pooh was both underdogs. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying in terms of how people viewed us, and it was mm -hmm. like, yo, we gonna we gonna go in here and lock in and make the you know the dopest shit we can make, and you know bringing Craig Lane, you know what I'm saying he was playing on on keys on some of the records, you know what I'm saying, and that's what it's always been about making uh filling up the speaker, a sample can only give you so much, you know what I'm saying. Say do you feel do you feel now that you've like this far into your production career and the fact that, you know, I mean, you're born in a year in which hip hip hop was created fully realized. So it's kind of different, you know, me being two decades older than you, like being a nine year old as hip hop's first starting, but for you to actually um, sort of be in a situation in which you are 
you know, like what what songs in the key of life to me, that's probably what like low end theory was to you <laughs> in terms yeah. of like being a six, seven year older when this is hidden. Um as as a producer, um, what are the the your your weapons of choice when you're making this these songs? Like are you still on the three thousand? Have you upgraded to oh, how no, people I'm on a- I'm on the MPCX now, and um, but I still track everything I like analog. You know, okay. I, yeah. I don't just bounce the file, so I still get hit the patch bay and go through the uh, EQs and uh, mic pre's, line and all that stuff, the eye boxes. It's just to me, you can't get the sound that I'm used to without it. I don't know how to achieve it, so I still go old school. Now don't change, bro. So you don't have a MacBook Pro? You don't you don't just like I, I'll sequence everything in the computer. I mean okay. with the drum machine, you know right. what I'm saying? But when I go to track out, you know what I'm saying? I'm tracking out through all vintage uh stuff. So is there a, a new round of young producers that uh are in Detroit that are sort of being mentored by you and Milk and, and Rick is the way that you guys were mentored through Dilla? Um Oh, hold on. Three said he got kicked out. He said, can somebody drop the link in the chat? And then oh, I okay. could uh, text it to him. Yeah, yeah well, but Jake, uh, Jake is going to hit you right now. Wait, is, time out. Jake, you want to come in? Yeah, I'm right here. All right. So you'll drop that to T3? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm yeah go ahead drop it in the chat and I'll and I text oh, it Oh, okay, perfect. Hold on one sec. All right, we'll get him back in a minute. I got to wrap up in like five to ten. Okay, perfect. Minutes. Keep, 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 keep talking, RJ. My apologies. Oh no, no problem. Okay. Uh, it, I mean, it's 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 guys out here. You got you got people who's um coming with with dope ideas. Um, it, it's it's attitude that's hindering them though. Hmm. For some reason, they they not able to um jail with anybody you know what i'm saying so it's right. like you you so want to work not, with them there's but, not a hip-hop shop sort of epicenter that someone in a way that maurice threw that stuff for you guys there's not someone carrying that tradition now nah but that's what me and t was talking about we was talking about um trying to open something you know what i'm saying where we can have the community come you got to spot the spots like paramuta here that do little dope DJ things, you know what I'm saying? Like around electronic music fest, things like that. But it's not a a, a whole lot of like a hub anymore that, that people can go to. And that's what we need to get back to, you know what I'm saying? In order to be able to raise up that next crop out the city. Okay. And I guess in terms of terrestrial radio is concerned, like does that have the same hold that, it once held in Detroit, like, is there any figure in radio that is just as expansive or wild or crazy as your, ch- you know, growing up in the early period was for you guys? You got T3 on the, on the radio now. So that's where, you know what I'm saying, you're getting that other variety of music. Okay. Yeah, I do a two-hour show on Sundays. Um, and they basically let me play what I want to play. I ain't going crazy though. I am not mojo crazy. Go gonna... crazy. You gotta no man. I'm telling you, you gotta go mojo crazy, yo. Yeah. yeah. You got to. Okay. Okay. I, I'm, I'm serious. Gonna... Like that's I, I, I remember Quest said go crazy. So I... <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Blame it on him. <laughs> no, but I, I feel like if th- that to me is that opens up so many creative portals. Cause even the first night. The first night, you know, when when you go there, you're sort of like, okay, I want to see what these cats really about because it sounds crazy on record, but let me see what they're about. And I'll never forget the first night that the three of you were in the basement together. Um, right before by ten leaves, he's like, "Yo," he he tells Dilla, he's like, "Yo, man," he's like, "I want you to make a joint to Herb Albert's Route 101," and I was like. Wait a minute. That's the song I always hear when, like, to me, that's the ultimate yacht rock 
dentist song that I mean, right. when you're at the dentist office or you're shopping, right. and I was like, wait, did he actually say he wants to rhyme to Route 101? Like, that's the most <laughs> craziest. Like, doesn't he mean Rise by Herb Alpert, not Route 101? He's like, no, he wants to like the the world's happy song. It's like, you're going to flip that shit? He's like, hell yeah, I'm going to flip that shit. Like, to <laughs> me, it's, I feel like what makes Detroit, Detroit special is that you guys are not quick to say the word no as fast as other people would. And I think that that's, you know, um, I, I think that's that's kind of notable, you know, and you already see the evidence of you already see the evidence of that um, and how the ripple effects and how it affects people. So, yeah, I know to you, it's just like, hey, I do two hour show on Sunday and it might not matter. But, you know, even if you reach one person. That that spark happens to you, then, I, you know, I feel like that's that's a job well done. Man, I wanted to ask y'all specifically about um one of the things I think is so uh, incredible about Detroit. Like, I remember when we were first coming up and, you know, everything was with, with Dilla. You know, everything, he played with time, you know what I'm saying? And things were late, you know what I'm saying? A, a kick might be early, snare might be late or vice versa. And I remember playing his stuff for, like, the older guys, like some of the older jazz musicians that, like, taught at our university or whatever. And they would just, all they could focus on, well, God, that snare, he's so late. Like, y'all like that? It's so late. I'm like, nah, that's what make it go. And so now it's 20 years later, and all of a lot of the Detroit stuff that's coming out, like, you know, your Babyface Ray, you know, T Grizzly, like a lot of the younger cats, they stuff is all ahead of the beat. Like, they rap ahead of the beat. And, like, my, right. <laughs> my boys, like, my kids, my sons, they eat that shit up, and they be trying to play me stuff. And when they were first, I'm like, God, they rapping ahead of the beat. Like, why don't they just slow down? But that's the way they like it. You know what I'm saying? And so... Um, for y'all, man, like when y'all look at like the younger generation that's coming out of Detroit, how do they look at y'all and how do y'all, you know, look at them? And is there any kind of cross um, uh, generational uh, conversation that happens between y'all? Uh, first of all, yes, I love it because it is so unorthodox. The goal. So of yeah. course, I'm loving this. And uh, <laughs> I think I said with somebody. And then we was calling it the run-on sentence style, like where you just all <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so they they found they did the opposite of what Slow Village do exactly, <laughs> and, yeah. Which we all pocket and all in the back, and they went mm -hmm. all the way for love it. Please, you know, I, <laughs> I I just want creativeness. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I'm always entertained when I listen to uh Sada Baby. I'm always mm -hmm. entertained. You know what I'm saying? So I like what they're doing, man. And I think, you know, everybody got to find their own way. And um, it, it, yeah, yeah, I love that Detroit shit. Yeah, for sure. Oh, man, I, I think, you know, it's they, you know, I was like, God, like, why? I don't get it. I don't get it. But, you know, they broke the rules the same way that we were breaking them. You know what I mean? And so it's like, well, yeah, I'm I'm not supposed to get it. I'm an old nigga now. So. Right. <laughs> if it's <laughs> drawing to you, then it's like, OK, they exactly. must be doing something right. Right. You know, much respect to you guys. Um, nah, straight up, to, man. Your like, to your creativity and thank you. Nah, seriously, bro. Sure. I mean, me and T, we've talked. I mean, we've all three of us, we've like talked. You know, at different points of time. But seriously, man, I just had to, you know, just say to y'all, bro, is we celebrate I twenty year and LB, and I tell people all the time when we were making our first album, you know, the listening, like I had, we listened to Fantastic Volume Two religiously i played the fucking mp3 tags off that damn album and like <laughs> i would hold it up in the studio and we would i would tell ninth pool all the crew straight up like yo if we ain't making nothing that can fuck with this then we don't need to waste our time right like, this is the bar if we ain't bringing it like these niggas right back it up because yeah they it's still with. it's still my north star to this day man 100 like, just... so nah man love y'all brothers man thank just thank you for everything love, man appreciate you thank you, you. so on behalf of uh the team Fontigolo, Laia, Unpaid Bill, Sugar Steve, myself, the great R.J. Rice, and the one and only T3, Detroit's own Slum Village. Um, wow. Support your gods, man. They're, they're, they're still here with us and carrying on an awesome legacy. This Quest Love Supreme, and we will see you on the next go-round, y'all. Thank you. Peace.